What's up, YouTube? Ryan Panny here, living the dream as per usual. Happy 2018 to you all. I hope it's off to a great start. You know, for me, I actually had a pretty decent 2017, so I wasn't like chomping at the bit to leave it behind. Like I feel like a lot of people were, but still, I am way more excited about this year and the potential that it holds. And God, what better way to look forward at the dawn of a new year than to dive back into an argument that I've been having <laughs> in one form or another since I was fucking 14 years old. Because that's exactly what this video is. Basically, I'm going to resurrect a very tired, very worn out thrash metal debate in the hopes that I can just put it to bed for good. Of course, your opinions are always evolving, but I'm sure that any writer or content creator out there can relate when I say that organizing my thoughts and putting them out to the world it gives a topic a, a bit of finality, a bit of closure. Even though in a month or in a year or 10 years, I might change my opinion on it. At least for now, I can kind of close the book on it, knowing that my thoughts are out there. So as an avid fan of the thrash metal genre for many years now, the most irritating debate that always comes up revolves around the genre's big four bands, Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, Anthrax, the four of whom have for a long time been informally regarded as such, but that term was kind of solidified about eight, nine years ago with a string of European shows and a couple in the States here that were billed as big four shows featuring these four bands. It was such a big deal that it was fucking broadcast in movie theaters. I went, I know. The problem is you can't discuss these four bands without someone interjecting about A, all the other great thrash bands that are just as deserving and are being slighted by not being included in this group, or B, even worse, who are the next big four? If these are the most important four bands in the genre, who are the next four? And do any of them deserve inclusion in the original four? I don't know, maybe I just overreact now because I'm so sick of hearing about this topic, but in my opinion, this whole debate is really misguided and almost pointless when you really break things down. Because the way I see it, when someone asks the question, are there any other thrash bands that deserve inclusion in the big four and who are they? To me, there are only two acceptable answers to that question. Only two. Out of the infinite things that people think, there are two acceptable answers. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna break down how I think about this topic. So then in the end of the video, even if you disagree with me, you can at least see where I'm coming from. So after Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, and Slayer, there are, there are a lot of bands that people whine about deserving to be mentioned in this conversation. But for the sake of this video, there are four bands that are most often mentioned. Exodus, Testament, Overkill, Death Angel. Bands like Creator or even Sepultura, they don't really count because thrash metal is an American genre. That's like putting Darkest Hour in the melodic death metal conversation. That, that's a Swedish export. That's where the genre started. The most important bands are gonna be from there. So anyway, these, these four American bands are most often brought up as the next big four. Four bands that some people believe deserve inclusion with these original big boys. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna take these four bands and we'll see how they stack up. So even though it sometimes feels like Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax were sort of arbitrarily grouped together, they really weren't at all. There are two basic components that set these bands apart. They are both the biggest bands in the genre and the most important and influential. But let's pick apart these two categories in more detail. The first category, that they're the biggest bands in the genre, is way simpler. It's just pure sales, commercial performance, visibility, continued relevance, and continued over decades of being around. We'll measure this part by just looking at the top selling albums in the US by each band. So the first one's Metallica. I'm sure you know how this is gonna go, but in case you don't, their number one selling album in America is the Black Album with 16 million copies. Next is And Justice For All with 8 million, and then Master of Puppets with 6 million. So in the unlikely event that you were wondering why Metallica headlined those big four shows, there you go. Metallica is absolutely light years ahead of everyone when it comes to this conversation. But next, look at Megadeth and their top selling albums in the US. First one, of course, is Countdown to Extinction with over 2 million copies sold here. And Russ in Peace sold over a million. And then Megadeth had four more records go platinum in the US with over a million copies sold. And you have Slayer, Seasons in the Abyss, over 800,000. Rain and Blood, just shy of 800,000. And then South of Heaven and Divine Intervention both went gold with over half a million copies sold here. And last, of course, you have Anthrax, who all four records between Among the Living and Sound of White Noise went gold. Now, on to our next big four. First up to bat is Testament. Big band, right? Got some MTV airplay back in the day, especially around the Ritual record, which even had a power ballad on it. They had a renowned guitar hero and Alex Skolnick, of course. Well, Testament's total sales in the US of all their albums to date is 1.4 million, which means that Anthrax, the least commercially successful of the big four, has their entire catalog beat by just three albums. That's pretty crazy, right? That's a pretty big difference. And in case you're wondering, the one testament record to almost go gold was Practice What You Preach. Next, we have Overkill, New Jersey's finest. They have sold a total of 625,000 records here in the US, with 1991's Horoscope being the highest one. 
It sold around 118,000. So Anthrax has Overkill's catalog beat by not even an album and a half. So all the sales of Among the Living and like three tracks of State of Euphoria have Overkill's entire sales beat, which Overkill has released a lot of albums. Then there's Exodus, who we'll frame a bit differently. Take like, for instance, their big comeback record, Tempo of the Dam, in 2004, where Steve Zetro Souza returned on vocals. It was a very big deal. I myself loved that record in high school. Well, that record, here in the US, that sold under 3,000 copies. By comparison, Anthrax's We've Come For You All, which came out around the same time, it came out in 03, that sold 10,000, even with Anthrax's kind of waning relevance at the time. So, <laughs> in terms of commercial success into the 2000s, Anthrax had Exodus beat by 330%. Like, it's not even the same league. And if we want to continue with that period in the, in the early 2000s, because let's face it, the big four is partly a longevity thing. In 04, Megadeth dropped a record too. Same year, Assemble the Dand. It was called System Has Failed, and it sold 46,000 records here. And you know what, for shits and gigs, let's just throw in Death Angel's The Art of Dying, which came out around the same time too. Actually, the first Death Angel record that I ever heard. That sold 2,100 copies. So the first part of the argument, pretty easy to see that commercially speaking, this next big four just does not stack up to the big four. Any idiot can see that, but still I wanted to sort of chuck these numbers at you just to make sure we're on the same page. And now we can move on to the much more complicated second part of the issue, which is impact and influence. So on the issue of influence and importance, in particular, the mention of testament is what fucking bothers me the most. That drives me absolutely insane. It probably drove me to make this video, to be honest. Are testament a great band? Absolutely. Fucking lootly, one of my favorite thrash bands. Do they fit with Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax in terms of influence? Are you fucking kidding me? I'll never forget reading this one thing. It's just it's etched into my brain for eternity. One of the many metal magazines that I subscribed to as a kid, you know, back when magazines were like a thing. God, I missed that. I forget who it was, but they ran this issue where they dug up all these vintage interviews from like the late 80s and early 90s. And one of the interviews was from the Clash of the Titans tour. 1991, Megadeth and Anthrax and Slayer were on a tour together. And the interview was with Dave Mustaine, Scott Ian, I think, and, and I, I think someone from Slayer too. And guess what one of the main interview topics was? The three of them were sitting around bashing this younger band Testament for sounding too much like Metallica. At that time, there really was still this generational animosity. You gotta remember, Testament is technically part of what's known as the second wave of thrash metal. So you can't argue influence when there's pure chronology in the way. The first Testament record came out in 1987, four full years after the first Metallica record, and after pretty much every big four band had released their seminal material. So saying Testament is anywhere near as influential as Metallica and Megadeth, to draw a death metal analogy, that's like saying Nile is as influential as Morbid Angel. Like, how is that possible when one band couldn't possibly exist without arriving in the wake of the other? Don't get me wrong, Testament is an important band, and especially, you know, did they influence a lot of bands when they started to flirt with the extreme metal sound in the 90s with records like The Gathering? Absolutely. fucking lutely But if we're talking about the birth of the thrash metal genre, to group them in with the big four, that's absurd. And Death Angel is a similar situation. Their first record came out in 87 too. You know, they were around. Their first demo came out in 83, but you gotta factor in both their revolving door of band members and just how long it took them to get their shit together. And because of all those logistics, they're still lumped in with that second wave of thrash metal where Testament's lumped in. Overkill are a bit more interesting. To me, Overkill's two biggest points of relevancy are A, that they're an East Coast band when everybody but Anthrax in this conversation is West Coast based, and B, that they are the most musically consistent of any of these bands, Slayer included. But unfortunately, those two things alone don't change the fact that, you know, sure, Years of Decay, Taking Over, Horoscope, killer records, but Overkill doesn't have a Rain in Blood or a Rust in Peace where you can trace this record's imprint back. The Rain in Blood and Rust in Peace imprint is ubiquitous in modern metal. Overkill may have had a very unique vocalist in Bobby Blitz, but musically, what they did mostly was just excel within the framework built by their peers. Their peers that may have been more visible and may have been more forward thinking. And finally, we arrive at Exodus. This is the band that 110% belongs with the Big Four when it comes to influence. Not only were they there from the beginning, being formed in the Bay Area in 81 with someone named Kirk Hammett being involved, not only do Metallica and Slayer openly admit to being influenced and inspired by Exodus, but their first record, Bonded by Blood, and I will go to my grave saying this, 
is as important a blueprint for the thrash metal genre as Metallica's Kill 'Em All was. So people who say that solely based on being pioneering creative forces, Exodus should be included in a big five, they have a very good point. But just to be devil's advocate for a minute here, besides the big gap in sales, of course, here's my theory about why Exodus ended up in a different category. I think it's because early on, their albums were inconsistent. Exodus' second album, Pleasure of the Flesh, and their fourth album, Impact is Imminent, pale in comparison to the essential Exodus material. Bonded by Blood, Fabulous Disaster, and you think to yourself, oh, whatever, they were inconsistent. But take a look at the first four or five albums by all the big four bands. There is not a single big four band that has less than two essential albums within their first five, seven years. So there you will see the disparity between Exodus' catalog and the catalogs of the big four. Still, Exodus, by the influence measure, absolutely deserving of mention alongside these four bands. Hence, my verdict on this topic. In my eyes, you can only have two possible opinions about this whole bullshit argument. You can either A, be salty that Exodus is not included based on their influence and argue for a big five, or B, you can understand the power of commercial viability and having a, a rock solid discography up front and be at peace with the big four the way it is. That's it, one or the other and then shut the fuck up. After a fucking decade plus of thinking about this nonsense, those are the two trains of thought that I find valid. Anything else, I don't wanna fucking hear it. I don't wanna hear about Testament, I don't wanna hear about Overkill, I don't wanna hear about Sepultura, I don't wanna hear about hardcore punk and crossover thrash, none of that. Believe me, you're wasting your time. And that is all she wrote for this topic. I don't wanna ever hear about this again, unless of course, you are leaving a very thoughtful, very intelligent comment below in response to my comments, in which case, I encourage you to do so. As always, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a comment, or shoot me a message so we can continue to talk music, and I'll see you guys soon.